Let's open our Bibles to Romans 15, and I'd like to just, uh, before I plunge into these questions and the, the, uh, the attending answers to the questions that, are, that is really huge if you look at what was asked, Romans 15, verse 4, this is why we get together. This is the purpose every time the church gathers, and I think sometimes we just need to repeat that. It's kind of like these corporations that have the people, you know, all say their purpose statement, so they're all remembering what they're doing and why they're doing it. This is why the church gathers. Chapter 15 of the book of Romans and verse 4. For whatever things were written before were written for our learning, that we, through the patience and comfort of the scriptures, might have hope. You know, the Bible is written about real people that lived in real places that had the very same real struggles all of us go through. You know, sitting here tonight, uh, there are struggles going on of job situations, family situations, losing family members. I mean, there are two people here. One lost their dad this week. The other lost their sister. They're here tonight. I mean, that is normal life going on. And there's only one place that everyone in every situation in life, every struggle, every problem, every challenge, every fear, every anxiety, can all equally be powerfully met, and it's the Scriptures. And look at the next verse, verse 5. Here is what happens when the Word of God is proclaimed. Verse 5, now may the God of patience and comfort, you want to be patient? God is the source of patience. You want to be comforted? God is the God of comfort. The God of patience and comfort grants you to be like-minded toward one another according to Christ Jesus, verse 6, that you may with one mind and one mouth glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. We gather together so the scriptures can comfort us so the scriptures can give us hope. God is a dispenser of comfort. God is a dispenser of hope and patience and going on. And as we all embrace that, he wonderfully harmonizes us. And uh, you know what Paul said to the Ephesians, we're kind and tenderhearted and forgiving one another because we're reminded of what God has done for us. And so that's why we've gathered. Now, if you have your bulletin, I'm going to read to you. I had no idea what this was going to turn into. Uh, when I launched on this, but how, uh, well, first of all, what is biblical history? It's because, I don't know if it was last week or the week before or sometime, I said something about, you know, the, the flood and the creation and everything else, and I said, and that's just, God has written history in advance, and so and someone said, well, what is biblical history? I mean, is all history biblical history? What is biblical history? Second one, how do the books of the Bible fit into history? And that's a fascinating question. Again, it's the real people in real places living in, in situations so much like ours. In fact, I look at the Syrian conflict that I talked about a couple weeks ago. Did you know there's been conflict in that country for 8,000 years? That's, that's 6,000 years. I mean, right from the beginning with the, the whole Aramean nation and the, everything that's been going on with that part of the world, there's been conflict in that area. And the Bible was written to people that were going through wars and struggles and famines and difficulties, just like today. And it's just relating those books to that time. And then how do we know the dates of events in the Bible? That's a good one. I'm going to have fun with that. I hope we get to that tonight. Because there actually are hard numbers in the Bible. Now I want to preface this by saying, I believe and teach what the Bible says to groups of people, both here and in other places, that say that's what it says, but that's not what it means. I prefer to believe that what God says is what he meant. Like this morning, if six times God said, a thousand years the devil's in the pit, a thousand years the devil, a thousand years he's in the pit, a thousand years, a thousand, a thousand years. You ask someone in 90% of the churches in America, or about 74% of them, what does that mean? They say, we don't know. But what did God say? Well, we don't know. I said, yes, you do. He said a thousand years. But they don't even want to say what he said because they already don't believe it. So I personally believe what it says. And so you can get, if you look at this, you can get hard numbers. And I'm going to show you dates for events in the Bible. And then what are some key events in the Bible that we all should know? So 
let's see, here we go, biblical history. History as given by the Bible. And I hope this projects up here. My uh, consultant, uh, Dan Smith, told me that I should never use dark backgrounds, but when I got done with this, I only had enough time to run over here, and I didn't have time to make the backgrounds right. But this is the essence of biblical history, and here it is. Christ is the theme of all history. You've heard the, the saying that it's his story. Basically, you could divide the Bible down into these two pieces. The Old Testament is the account of a nation through which the promised one would come. The New Testament is the account of the man who is the creator, who appeared as the central event of all history, and this is why he died to purchase our redemption. That's why history is all about redemption. God invading humanity and coming to redeem us. He came to become like us so that he could take upon himself our sin so that he could be our redeemer. And the most exalted privilege in life is to know the creator. To know the one that brought everything that's in existence into existence and the one who is alive today working out his plan. And the greatest thing in life is to know him. In fact, salvation is knowing God personally. And, and tonight, uh, I was just reading a testimony before the baptismal meeting tonight, and, and it was a beautiful testimony about someone that had been associated with the church their whole life, but only in the last few weeks in a Bible study did they realize that though they knew about the Lord in their head, they'd never repented of their sins, confessed their lostness. They just thought they were Christian because they knew all this stuff. And they came to faith, personal faith in Jesus Christ. And that's what the Bible is all about. Well, tonight, here's a panorama. If you take your Bible, and if you've made a chart out of it, uh, this is what the Bible teaches. The book of Genesis talks about God who existed before creation, but the book of Genesis takes us from the creation of the universe in six literal, God said, 24-hour days. And he, you don't have to have Genesis 1 to believe that. Exodus 20, when God was talking to three million slaves who had spent their whole existence as slaves in Egypt, he said, as you go to work, six solar 24-hour days, and you get the seventh day off, and you don't have to work, so in that same six solar 24-hour days, I made everything that exists in this universe, and I ceased from laboring on the universe on the seventh day. That's how God presents everything that we know in the book of Genesis. Probably, if you hold to what God says, the entire scope of human history is only 6,000 years at the most. Uh, basically, the flood, if you take the dates that are in the Bible, there are 1,656 years from Adam's first year through Noah starting the, the first drop of rain in the flood, 1,656 years. And then you have the time period from that through Abraham, through the Exodus, through David. So basically, 2,348 years BC, 2,348 years before Christ is when the ark rested on Mount Ararat and human civilization as we know it came into existence. That means the pyramids, the monuments on Easter Island and all the monoliths around the world are somewhere after this because there is nothing on the surface of the earth that hasn't had a mile of water on it and a whole bunch of volcanoes spewing over it. And so everything that you see on this planet dates from the flood onward. Abraham he was born in the year 2166, lived till 1991. I'll show you in a little while how we get that number. The Bible very clearly dates this event, the Exodus. In fact, the Exodus is such an important event that when the temple foundation was laid by Solomon in 1 Kings chapter 6, verse 1, it says that exactly 480 years ago to the, the founding of the temple foundation, the Israelite nation was brought out of Egypt. So we have hard dates in the Bible. That's what it says. Now people say, oh, it doesn't mean that, but that's what it says. David, I mean, now we're getting into modern history. Uh, David uh, lived from about 1040 BC to 970. He died at about the age 70, the exile. Uh, Babylon uh, 
took the children of Israel into exile and Christ was born about 4 BC. Uh, It's interesting how Christ could be born four years before Christ, but it's because of the Julian calendar and the Greg Uh, the Gregorian calendar and all the other changes that have taken place in the calendar. Um, Basically, Genesis, as you see, covers the lion's share of history as far as from biblical history. The rest of the Old Testament only covers this this little snatch uh, right here from the, the exodus through the exile. That's all the rest of the Old Testament. There are 400 years, see right here, of silence. There's no prophetic utterance from any of God's prophets. And then John the Baptist booms forth by the Jordan River, and that starts the period of the New Testament. And the New Testament epistles cover, at the most, uh, a period of about 100 years through about 95 AD. Uh, You see right here, this is the cross of Christ. Um, At AD 70, that about 40 years after the cross, the Romans came, leveled the city of Jerusalem, destroyed the temple, and carried off, massacred and carried off a million Jews, and dispersed them through over 100 countries around the world. In fact, Israel today, in Israel today, 100 different languages are spoken, because Jews have come back from 100 different countries all over the world. And uh, God said that he was going to restore Israel uh, as a nation. And by the way, uh, he restored them as a nation in 1948, just like he said in Ezekiel. And he restored to them their place of worship, uh, although they haven't done anything with it, in the Temple Mount in 1967. And so it's very interesting uh, that that we're into prophetic territory here. Um, So that's whoever asked... um, What is biblical history? It's history the way God presents it. Uh, It's history if you just take what the Bible says and believe it. Um, Next, um, uh, this uh, time period that we're in, theologians have divided uh, our understanding of what God is doing in this whole event. If you take the same biblical history the Bible presents from creation through eternity and has all of these different events of, you know, the people that lived before the flood and after the flood and Abraham and the people that lived around Moses' time and in the kingdom and those who were at the church and those who are going to be here during this thousand-year reign. And so basically, theologians have divided our understanding of how God operates with them into two divisions, either covenant Uh, theology or dispensational theology. Covenant theology is is pretty simple. What they say is um, there's two covenants, the covenant of works, and that's before the fall, and then the covenant of grace, and that's after the fall. But within this covenant, they have seven subdivisions. That's covenant theology. Dispensationalists Uh, believe that there are seven dispensations. So in that sense, covenant theologians and dispensationalists see the same divisions, but they have total different ways of discussing them. Uh, Calvary Bible Church is historically a dispensational church that teaches there's the dispensation, and by the way, the word dispensation in Greek, uh, the word is dispensation is the word oiko um, uh, nomia, that isn't quite spelled right, but oiko is house and nomia are rules or laws. You know, when you go to someone's house, you're supposed to take your shoes off, you're supposed to, you know, wash your hands and, you know, before the meals or whatever, you know, and and you kind of have rules. Well, it's how God operated in these different segments. Those are called dispensations. And basically, theologians, these aren't in the Bible, by the way, they're just divisions that people see as they read the Bible, uh, that conscience is before any revelation of God. Finally, with Noah, uh, human government starts. Innocence is before the fall. Conscience is after the fall. Human government is starting in Genesis 9 when uh, uh, God says that if you shed man's blood by man's hand, shall your blood be shed. There there begins to be human government. And then uh, the promised and covenants that God made with Abraham, then when Moses came along, Uh, People were responsible, as Paul said, those who have the law will be judged by the law. Those who don't have the law will not be judged by the law. So that's called the dispensation of the law. Then the church, Paul said in Galatians that the law 
in Galatians 3 was a schoolmaster that brought us to Christ. In other words, that the law can't do anything except point out, it's kind of like the teacher that doesn't encourage you, just says, don't do that, don't do that, don't do that, that's wrong, that's wrong, that's wrong. That's what the law did. It made us see how far we fall short of God's holiness. So the dispensation of the law is that the people could not get to heaven by keeping the law, but the law was to show them that they had to obey the sacrificial system and trust in another. The whole sacrificial system was that I bring my lamb, I put my hands on it and confess my sins over it because I can't save myself. And so what a dispensationalist would say is people have always been saved the same way, but God treated them according to how much knowledge they had. If you remember what Paul says, he says that in time past, God winked. He overlooked some things because the people did not know that. But now has declared, when Christ came, that all men should repent. And so what he's saying is God treated people differently, but he had one plan of salvation, which has always been substitutionary atonement. Right from the beginning, at the fall of man, what was, what was Adam instructed to do? He was instructed to cover himself and his wife with the skins of an animal that was sacrificed for them. And then they taught their sons that they were to offer the best sacrifices to the Lord. You know what Cain did. He gave God his produce for the, from the 4-H section of the fair. But Abel brought a bloody sacrifice and God accepted it because Abel did what the Lord wanted. But substitutionary atonement, a substitute, has always been salvation. Salvation, we uh, look back. We're on this side of the cross and we're looking back at what Christ did for us 2,000 years ago. They, with their substitutionary sacrifices, were looking forward to the offering that God was going to have. And it says in the book of Hebrews, the last verse of chapter 11, that they, before Christ, could not be perfected without us because we look back on what Christ did and they look forward to it. So this is a dispensational view. And by the way, you see the last one, that God begins operating uh, in, in another household set of rules during the kingdom. And that's a fascinating time, the kingdom um, a major percentage of the Old Testament talks about the millennial kingdom. Maybe 10% of the Old Testament. And it's all kinds of rules. Uh, did you know that God, again, it's his, I mean, he can set the rules up he wants. He seems to revert to a lot of the principles from the Mosaic time during the kingdom. Uh, they have to come to Jerusalem they have to offer sacrifices. You say, sacrifices? Sacrifices? Oh, I thought Christ did away with sacrifices. Well, wait a minute. Communion is next Sunday night. What is communion? Communion is a memorial celebration looking back at what Christ did on the cross. It is, it is us holding in our hands a picture of his sacrifice. Did the Old Testament people get saved by killing animals? No. They got saved by faith that God wanted them to realize they couldn't save themselves, that they needed a, an innocent substitute to take their place. Those animals were dying in the place of the people who deserved to die because of their sin in the Old Testament. So in the kingdom, the millennium time, they are offering the sacrifices all of which pointed to Christ. It had to be a perfect male, blameless, spotless, that, that was innocent, that shed its blood helplessly, throat split. The whole picture, every part of the Old Testament sacrificial um, system pointed to Christ. Every part, even the, the law of cleansing leprosy. If you read Leviticus, uh, it's this amazing. You take two clay pots, you take two pigeons, you kill one pigeon and actually shed its blood. You put the living pigeon in the pot, you shake it up, and you open the lid and let the bloody pigeon that's alive fly away. And it sounds weird, you know, like gross. Now that's a picture of Christ. 
they had to have his death, his burial, and his resurrection. So that's why they needed two pigeons, because priests couldn't raise pigeons from the dead. And they put the blood of the pigeon that died on the pigeon that lived and allowed it to fly out of the pot to show that Jesus Christ rose from the dead through the sacrifice of his blood is the only way we're cleansed. I mean, every one of those Old Testament sacrifices. So in the dispensation of the kingdom, those sacrifices will be pointing back to the cross. And so that's why, this, that's why the covenant theologians don't even believe in the kingdom because they can't process why they would have the sacrificial system reinstituted. But no one was saved by the sacrificial system in the Old Testament, neither shall they be saved by it in the kingdom. But that is, um, the, the dispensational view is how we can explain what God is doing in what he describes in his word when you look at the whole scope of history. So whoever asked that question, I hope I answered it. Um, as you look at the scope of history, there are three major promises that predicate, that influence all of biblical history. One is God made a covenant with Abraham and he made this covenant with him and said that, that through the seed of Abraham, all the nations on earth would be blessed. And there's two parts to that. One is that Paul said in the book of Romans that everything we know about God has come through the Jewish people. All of the scriptures were written by Jewish people. And those, well, except for the part that Nebuchadnezzar wrote, but the rest of the scripture were written by people that were either proselytes to Judaism or actual descendants of Abraham. So in that sense, because the Bible has brought to us salvation, the understanding the, the truth of God that leads to salvation, all of us are blessed, but the ultimate seed, and it's singular, the ultimate seed of Abraham is Jesus Christ. And he certainly has blessed uh, in offering himself as a sacrifice. So that's God's covenant with Abraham. And, and by the way, God promised Abraham with an everlasting oath that he would never break his promise with his people. And that's why covenant theologians say that God didn't break his covenant with the, the Jewish people. He just transferred it to the church. And what's interesting is the Lord didn't know he did that um, because he doesn't say anything about it. He said that I have made an everlasting covenant with Abraham, with his descendants, the Jewish people. And that's why, when you come back here, that's why this whole uh, period of Israel being restored and what we're going to see in a moment through the prophets of the future plans God has for Israel all of that is because he made this unbreakable promise. Even though the Jews are living in unbelief, God is preserving them. There shouldn't be any Jews left. They should be exterminated by now. There's no ethnic group of people that have ever faced so many extermination attempts. And it didn't start with Hitler. It's been going on in Russia's pogroms, all of the the mess through the Middle Ages of, of killing the Jews, all the way back to Haman, the Agagite, the descendant of Amalek, who tried to kill all the Jewish people in the book of Esther. But God says, I've made an eternal, unbreakable covenant. A second covenant he made, God made with Israel. And basically, it was one of these, if then, if then. And he says, if you faithfully serve me, uh, you will prosper if you forsake me. And we covered that last time in chapter 26 of Leviticus. God says, I'm going to make you run for your life. You'll be in fear. You'll, you'll just be scattered throughout the earth. And that's because he made a covenant with them. And they agreed to this covenant at Sinai. They says, we'll, everything you say we'll do. And they didn't. And that produces this. This diaspora word you probably can't even read that down there, but the, the dispersion of the Jewish people throughout the whole world, the wandering Jew comes from that covenant God made with them. And, you know, it's kind of like uh, the fiddler on the roof, you know, if you have ever listened to that, he's saying, why, 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 why? It's because they entered into a covenant with God. That's why, this has nothing to do with the question to ask, but that's why Divorce is so dangerous. Uh, I, I regularly meet with people that want to divorce each other. And I say, you can divorce each other. I mean, 
You can get one of these $99 attorneys and just do it. But you know what? It's like taking glass and throwing it on your tile floor and smashing it all over your house. You're going to have to live in the house the rest of your life, and you're going to walk over glass the rest of your life. God is very focused on covenants, and marriage is a covenant made with God. You break that, you're walking on broken glass the rest of your life. Yes, you can marry someone else. You can start over again and everything else. And there are many wonderful remarriages. There is also the breaking of a covenant that was made in the sight of God. And the Lord says there's only two things that can take away the covenant. And that is the death of the person you're married to or their unfaithfulness in departing from the marriage, morally or physically deserting the marriage. So be very careful. But nobody asked me about that, but I brought it up myself. (laughs) Thirdly, God made a covenant with David that his family would produce the Messiah. And that's why Jesus, when he comes at Christmas that we just celebrated, is called the son of what? David. Yeah, he's the son of David. And and the Pharisees and scribes and Sadducees couldn't figure this out. He says, how come the Lord uh, calls himself the son of David? And they couldn't figure it out. It's because of this covenant that God made with David, that David was a man after his own heart, and that he was going, that's why when David heard this, he says, how come? Why are you blessing me this way? So those are three big covenants. Um, Now, a backdrop to all this, to that chart of the overview of, of history, is what has historically been called the scarlet thread of redemption. The scarlet speaks of blood, so it's the, the scarlet thread of redemption. Uh, it says in the Bible, in whom we have redemption uh, through his blood. And so the scarlet thread is seeing redemption all the way through. Uh, If you look in your Bibles in Genesis 3.15, it says that there's going to come the seed of the woman who will crush the serpent's head. That's what Jesus was doing on the cross, crushing. Hebrews 2 says he destroyed him that had the power of death, that is the devil. That's what Jesus was doing on the cross. He was destroying the one who had death, as, as his calling card, and he destroyed Satan's power to hold people. That's why before the cross, all the saints were kept in that place they were kept in that we've talked about that I've answered several times. Because until the cross, Jesus couldn't bring them up into dwelling in, in his presence. They had to stay in that place called Abraham's bosom until after the cross, and then he brought them up. So the seed of the woman said that the Redeemer is going to come through the human race. And so the, the Redeemer, the one who is going to pay the price of sin, the only thing we learn in Genesis is they're going to be human. So that's why Jesus had to become the God-man. He had to come in human flesh. When we get to Abraham, we find in Genesis 22 and verse 18 that this Redeemer is going to be Jewish. See, that's why we have the Bible. It's the slow narrowing down of who is going to be this Savior, this Redeemer, this this one that was promised that would, would shed their blood. By the time we get to Jacob, we find out that they're going to be not just a human and a Jew. They are going to be from one of the 12 tribes, the tribe of Judah. And, and so we're, it's narrowing down into a uh, tribe. And then through David, we find it's actually through the family of David. That's why uh, Joseph had to go to Bethlehem because he was of the house and lineage of what? David. See, that's, this, this, this whole drama of redemption is God telling what is going, and and by the way, the devil didn't know. And so that's why here, the devil tries to destroy all humans by the demon intrusion that prompted the flood of Noah. And then, once he finds out it's Abraham, he gets Hagar involved. He's trying to dilute the seed and and have this Egyptian woman ruin this, this plan. And then he's got Jacob 
running off into a far land, hoping he'll get waylaid and killed, and the angels are watching him as he's sleeping on a rock, you know, at Bethel. And then here, the devil's doing everything he can from trying to, to have Goliath kill David, to having Saul try and kill David, to having David running for his life, and then going into adultery, hoping God will kill him, and he won't have this promised seed. So Satan has always been at work. And by the way, when, when it was found out by Satan that it was Jesus, what did Satan do? He tries to have all the babies killed. Couldn't do that. He tries to drown Jesus when he's sleeping in the boat. That didn't work. He tries to get a crowd to stone him to death on numerous occasions. See, Satan doesn't want Christ's work to be accomplished. And that's why at the cross, um, he was sorely disappointed. So let's just focus first on this first section. Um, and I don't know, it was one of the questions saying, um, how do we get dates from the Bible? So let me show you some dates uh, that, that we get in the Bible. Um, first of all, the patriarchs. Uh, patriarchs, uh, R.K., uh, speaks of, of high or old and patria is father. So it's the old fathers or the high fathers, the patriarchs, the, the ones who are the, the, the high fathers, the exalted ones. Abraham is the one that God um, calls to himself. Uh, Abraham was a Gentile that became a Jew, became the first Jew, became the father of the Jews. We know from the Bible exactly the date he was born, and I'll show you how we get that in just a minute. Um, Abraham actually had three wives. Here's two of them, Hagar. Uh, his actual half-sister wife, uh, his wife of, of his youth, the servant girl, and there's going to be one that, that he marries after Sarah dies. Um, again, Satan is trying to mess up the plan. And so because God made Sarah not conceive, now remember the Bible says God grants conception. Now, I, we do a lot of things, and there's all kinds of a whole medical science for conceptionology, but the bottom line is there is no conception of a child apart from God allowing it. That means there's no accidental babies, and that's why that poor senator that said whatever he said uh, was so vilified during the campaign season because the guy sounds like he's a believer. And what he said is even a child conceived through rape and there are several in the Bible that are conceived through rape, is God's plan because he allowed him to be conceived. But no one asked me about that, so I shouldn't go down that line. But here comes Ishmael because Satan is trying to ruin the plan. And so he has Abraham uh, figure out how to circumvent you know, having children the way that God planned, and he's going to have them his own way, and he gets Ishmael. And Ishmael is a really blessed fellow. Ishmael, because he's a son of Abraham, fathers, Ishmael has 12 sons too. Did you know that? If you read carefully in the Bible, it's not just that Jacob had 12 sons. Ishmael has 12 sons. And his 12 sons are the people that made $1 trillion last year selling us oil. Those are the descendants of Ishmael. They're doing very well. All of Abraham's descendants are doing really well. But God says, no, here's my son of promise. And by the way, this is what the whole conflict is. Who is the Lord? Is it Yahweh that said that the son of promise is Isaac? Or is it, uh, is it Allah who the Muslims say Ishmael is the one? is the son of promise. See, the Quran says that Abraham offered Ishmael on the altar, and God says, don't kill Ishmael. Ishmael's my promised one. And by the way, when we get into uh, Revelation 6, I, I don't want to spoil it for you, but did you know that the Muslims, Jesus is in the Quran very clearly, there is an antichrist, uh, there's a false prophet, all the things that are in the scriptures, Satan has duplicated in the Quran. It's fascinating. We don't realize how much Satan has been at work right from the beginning. As soon as God identified Abraham as the family through which his nation is going to come, Satan's been busy. And, and I'm not saying every descendant of Ishmael is satanic, but I'm saying 
the, the arrival of Ishmael was part of what Satan was planning to do, but God is using it for his glory. So Isaac is born when Abraham is 100 years old. You see right there, 2166, when the year 2066 BC, Isaac's born. And you know, they uh, send off the servant to find a wife for Isaac. Isaac gets married when he's 40, doesn't have any kids until he's 60. He waited a long time too. And then he has twins. Jacob and Esau. And what's fascinating is Esau, who sold his, his firstborn right as a son inheritance to his brother for a bowl of soup, who does Esau align with? He intermarries with Ishmael. In fact, Esau, uh, in the Old Testament, he is the father of Edom. The Edomites, the Ishmaelites, and we'll see later when I do Keturah, and also Lot, Abraham's uh, nephew, all of those people have intermarried and all of them have become the enemies of God. I'm talking about in the Bible, not today. Um, but they have aligned themselves, the Edomites, uh, the Ishmaelites, and the, the sons of Dedan and all the other Keturah descendants are all lined up as enemies of God in the Bible. And by the way, just for you to know, Esau who the Bible calls Edom, is the father of King Herod. There's another way Satan was at work. King Herod becomes the king of this side of the genealogy, and he doesn't belong there. Herod is from this side. He's from over here. He's an Edomite. He's not a Jew. He's an Edomite. But he became the king of the Jews, and when the descendant... That, that came down through Judah, Jesus Christ, when he came, Herod tries to kill him. Again, Satan trying to destroy the plan of God. And these are, by the way, the 12 sons through the, the uh, whoop, it starts here, the four wives of Jacob, the 12 sons, and all that. I don't even know if anybody asked me about that. There's the other half of the uh, uh, family tree of Abraham, his uh, first wife, second wife, last wife, right here, Keturah. After um, Sarah died, he takes another wife and has one, two, three, four, five, six more children. Seven, eight. Perfect family, eight. Um, uh, <laughs> just okay, just seeing if you're listening. But look at what his descendants become. The Saudi Arabians today, by their geographic location, are the descendants of Sheba and Dedan. And then all of these are what we call the Bedouin people today uh, that live in, I mean, there's still, if you, go to, if you go to the land of Israel, you see these people living there in tents. They, it, you can go to a, a Bedouin tent today and see exactly what Abraham lived like, very simply with their herd and flocks around them. Um, but, but all of these Keturah uh, this children and descendants were sent by Abraham. He sent them with, with all kinds of treasures and said, leave the area where my son of promise is living and go to the east. So they go east to Saudi Arabia and they sent off Hagar with Ishmael to the same place and Esau joins them and intermarries along with you know, this nephew Lot, who had the Midianites. Lot had two children, or two Ill or, uh, incestuous children through his daughters, the Midianites and uh, the Ammonites. And what's interesting is, one of the descendants of, of the Midianites is Amalek. So, so all of the enemies of Israel, even today, if you read uh, the Psalms, it describes the final battle. There's going to be Psalm 83 tells about the final battle Israel's going to have with their enemies. And it lists off the descendants of Sheba and Dedan, the Amalekites, the Ishmaelites, uh, you know, all of these people the Midianites and the Ammonites, and all of them are relatives of Abraham. And all of them are tied to Satan's desire to destroy that scarlet thread 
of redemption by intermarrying and destroying the, the lineage. And so, um, a lot of prophetic history is based on the Keturites and the Hagarite descendants as well as Esau's. Um, now in biblical history, um, getting back to one of those questions, uh, the Exodus. Some of you might wonder how we get that 1446 date. I will show you that in a minute. But basically, uh, from Moses in the time of the Exodus, uh, there's, there's the 40-year wandering in the wilderness. Then there's the conquest uh, of the land of Canaan uh, by Joshua. And that goes right into the book of Judges, the time of the Judges. And the final judge is right here, Samuel. Uh, and Samuel uh, anoints Saul, and Saul is the people's choice, but not God's choice. And then Samuel anoints David, and this starts the amazing um, work of God in Israel, and that's very central. And to show you a little... Uh, this is to answer the Bible question. So let's all turn to 1 Kings 6.1, uh, because somewhere in the questions is, uh, how do we know dates in the Bible? So I'm going to give you a quick um, lesson, 1 Kings chapter 6. I'm going to show you something very interesting. Uh, 1 Kings 6.1 tells us something about Solomon's temple. And it came to pass in the 400th, an 80th year after the children of Israel came out of the land of Egypt. So here's 480 years. And the 480 years is before the event we're reading in chapter 6, verse 1. And what we're reading about there is that in the month of Ziv, which is the second month, he began to build the house of the Lord. This is a historically findable date. In fact, if you look on Google, look at Jerusalem's 3,000th anniversary. Jerusalem celebrated their 3,000th anniversary because even secular people say that David, I mean, uh, Muslim scholars won't say this probably, but, but normal Western scholars will say that David reigned in Jerusalem 1000 BC. I mean, most people accept the reality that David lived because we have the Psalms, we have the Jewish people, and we have all the, the history. Well, David reigned as king until um, David reigned from 1010 to 970. And in 970 BC, his son Solomon sat on the throne. And Solomon got busy building his own house and got busy marrying all those women. And finally, he got down to building the, in 966, in the fourth year of his reign, he started building the temple. And if you add those two numbers together, 480 years before he started building the temple, it takes you to a hard number, 1446 BC. That's the year God says the exodus took place. Boy, that makes life fascinating. Did you know today, if you go to Wikipedia, it's actually Wikipedia, but it's wicked too. If you go there and look up which pharaoh was sitting on the throne in 1446 B.C. Now, n no, no secular and even a lot of Christian scholars believe God's date. This is a hard number that God established, 1446 B.C. Most of them say that the Exodus was in 1200 B.C. during Ramses. I think that's because Disney made a movie. I'm not sure. There's no reason in the Bible for that. But since the movie says it was Ramses, you know, Disney said it, everyone believes it. But God says this number. But if you look in Wikipedia and look up what guy was sitting on the throne then, you know what the Wikipedia article says? Fascinating. I like it so much I've copied it out. I don't want him to remove it. It says, the pharaoh sitting on the throne then is an amazing pharaoh that something happened to and his firstborn son dies prematurely 
and his second-born son becomes the pharaoh. That's the only, of all the pharaohs in Egypt that you read about on Wikipedia, only that one does it say that about. And it's true. In the, the records of Egypt, this pharaoh's son did not become pharaoh. His younger son did, which was really amazing. And that's all because we know what happened to his oldest son. He died in the night of the original Friday the 13th. Because we know that Passover is on the 14th of Nisan. So the night before, when the firstborn were killed, was Friday the 13th of Nisan, which is where the tradition of Friday the 13th comes from, right from 1446 B.C. Um, the rise, of, that's not a joke either, that's true. Uh, the rise and fall of the monarchy, and real quickly, uh, where do the books, someone ask in the questions, where do you fit? Uh, where do the books of the Bible fit into history? Basically this, First, Second Samuel, uh, just covers the life of Samuel, Saul, and David. The Kings basically covers heavily uh, uh, the end of David's 40-year reign, all of Solomon's reign, and then the kingdom after Solomon, all the way to the exile by the Assyrians of the northern kingdom. In, there's another hard number we know from history, 722 B.C., and the Babylonians came along in 586 and destroyed Jerusalem, carted off the Jews. What's interesting is that First and Second Chronicles doesn't seem to be the same. And the reason is, the purpose of First and Second Chronicles is to keep those bloodlines of the priests and of the kings, the, the genealogies for, that's why it's called Chronicles, and it has all those, you know, uh, family tree charts, because this is where the proof, uh, it's interesting, through First and Second Chronicles, we understand what's going on with Joseph and Mary. Mary's lineage goes through Solomon. Joseph's lineage goes through Nathan. Joseph is one that was a true man that was a descendant of David, but Mary went through a line where her child would not be cursed. Uh, the two lines if you read Chronicles, there was one king that was a real bad guy called Jeconiah. What a name, Jeconiah. And, or Coniah, he's called also. They take the G-J-E off. And this guy is cursed by God because he was so wicked and apostate. And God said, no descendant of yours will ever sit on the throne. And again, Satan was jumping up and down because this was destroying the the descendants of David. But it's interesting that, that under David, the royal line splits between Solomon and another son of David, Nathan. And Solomon's line had this Jeconiah guy that is cursed. But Nathan, another son of David, is the family tree, if you read in Luke, that Mary descended through and this is the family tree that Joseph descended through, and that's why Joseph was not, I mean, we already know it, but Joseph couldn't have been the father of the Messiah because he was from this cursed line. And that's why, if you ever get bogged down reading Chronicles, there's a real reason for it. God is, even in the minutia of the genealogies, showing his divine plan. Basically, uh, the, the books of the Bible, again, someone asked about the dates, um, 1 Samuel covers up from Samuel into Saul. 2 Samuel covers all the way through David into Solomon. King starts with David's death and goes through all of Solomon. The divided kingdom in 930 when Solomon dies, uh, he has a wascally, to use, you know, uh, term, son by the name of Rehoboam. And he was a real rascal. Um, he wouldn't listen to the elders. He listened to his buddies. And Rehoboam was very proud. He was raised in too much money. And, and he's the one that said that my little finger uh, will be thicker than my father's thigh. I'm going to get every dime out of you I can in taxes. And the kingdom split. And Jeroboam took the northern half. And uh, the, this is when the monarchy becomes divided. The southern kingdom took two tribes, Judah and Benjamin. The northern kingdom takes 10 tribes. And they 
um, Jeroboam doesn't want them trotting back to Judah, to Jerusalem, to hear, you know, to go back with the, the southern people. So he institutes the golden calf worship in Dan and Bethel. And he actually brings Israel into idolatry and, and just wreaks devastation on them. And what the Lord does is he cuts them off in 722. The Assyrians come through, kill them, exile them, and they never return. They're, they are sent to modern-day Syria, modern-day Iraq, and modern-day Iran, Iran, and just sprinkled all over the world. But God is patient with the, the, the southern kingdom. He allows them to go on for another 150 years, but they slowly succumb to the idolatry, and so Babylon comes and destroys them. And all of that is in 2 Kings, and also all of it is in First and Second Chronicles. Um, basically, we can, we can uh, give the stats on these two teams. The northern team, Israel, had 19 kings, reigned 250 years, so that's an average of about 12 plus years per king. The southern kingdom had 20 kings that went an average of 18 and a half years. This is telling seven different dynasties. Um, Jeroboam goes for a little while, but then Jeroboam, because of his idolatry, is cut off and you know, goes into dynasty after dynasty, seven different dynasties. Uh, almost every other king is from a different dynasty until the Assyrians take him into captivity. The southern kingdom is one dynasty, the house of David, and the Babylonian captivity, there are three dates for it. You say, why? Can't you figure out which one? Well, there's reason for it. Um, and this is just a listing of the kings. And uh, every one of the northern kingdom kings were bad. And it's hit and miss in the southern kingdom. There are good and bad. Um, and we already covered that. Forget that. Um, and these are the prophets that line up with them. Um, and it's just for you to know the dates of the book. Like Jeremiah uh, is, is during the time of this Jehoiakim guy. Um, I mentioned right here. And Daniel is, is uh, after Zedekiah. Ezekiel is after that. Just to give you a perspective during these very difficult last days. But let me show you um, something here. Uh, Babylon. Uh, King Nebuchadnezzar is raised up by God to become the first world empire. And in the year 605 B.C., as he's on his way to fight the Egyptians and others, he swings by Israel, knocks down part of Jerusalem's wall, and carries off Daniel and his three buddies. That's how they get to Babylon. Daniel and the three. Then Nebuchadnezzar just, you know, warns them and gets tribute from them, and he goes home and keeps conquering everything, and he swings back by eight years later, 597 B.C., and this time he picks up Ezekiel and takes him to Babylon, and that's where you read the book of Ezekiel. Daniel has been there for eight years. Ezekiel shows up. In the third siege, this is when God said enough is enough. This time Nebuchadnezzar systematically breaks down the entire wall all the way around, levels the temple, and just murders all the people. And those that, that he doesn't murder, he takes them to Babylon, anybody that could help him out. Now, why three different times? Because God has warned in the book of Leviticus and warned through the prophet Jeremiah that Israel is going to have to do two things. They have this servitude as a nation where they're going to serve another nation for 70 years. But also, um, God says a second thing, that Jerusalem is going to be desolate with its walls broken down and, and horribly lying desolate like the book of Lamentations talks about for 70 years. Well, Nebuchadnezzar didn't flatten the place until 586. So this one ends with a decree from Artaxerxes, but this servitude, they're allowed to go back by Cyrus, but they weren't allowed to rebuild 
the, the uh, temple in Jerusalem um, and to get everything going uh, and to put the walls up and become a real city until uh, the second decree. And so basically, well, Cyrus let them go back and they started building the temple, but Artaxerxes let them go back and wall their city and become independent. Now again, showing you for whoever asked about the dates, Daniel is right there. He is uh, in the sixth century BC, Ezekiel follows him. The book of Chronicles is chronicling all this because the book of Chronicles is written and finished by Ezra. Uh, concurrent with Ezra is Haggai, who is prophesying that they need to spend as much money building the house of the Lord as they are on paneling their own houses with cedar while they're building the temple. Zechariah is talking about the ultimate future state of, and we've read Zechariah prophetically, Nehemiah follows Ezra. And uh, by the way, Ezra um, was the one that copied the Bible, that started the scribes, that actually started the synagogue and all of that. And then of course, the final uh, Old Testament prophet was from Italy, his name is Malachi. And uh, he is, uh, or Malachi, it is getting late. One more minute, we have to go. Let's see where we're ending. This is where we'll pick up next time because I think this is the most significant thing of all. I mentioned it this morning. While Daniel is in Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar has a dream. And Nebuchadnezzar dreams in Daniel 2 that he sees this tall image that has a head of gold and it has this uh, neck down to waist of silver. You notice that the metals get cheaper and stronger. Brass, waist down, and then iron down to the feet. And the, the last thing is iron mixed with clay. Uh, in the feet. And basically, Daniel is told by God that he's seeing time from Daniel's time in the 6th century BC until the second coming. And what God tells Daniel is there are going to be four world empires. Babylon was the first, the Medo Persians are the second, the Alexander the Great. Hellenization of the world is the third, and the final empire is Rome. Rome supposedly falls, but Rome only broke into pieces, and each of the pieces of Rome, Germany, Spain, Britain, we could go on and on. Every piece of the Roman Empire has had its day ruling the world. In fact, the greatest extent was Great Britain, but what happens is Rome, in some form, and we'll talk about that next time, comes back. Only it's a mixed bag. It's iron and clay. And so there's a lot of, and also it's in two parts because there's two legs. This one body goes down into two legs, and it's, all of that is significant. But we're going to talk about that, and also um, what's interesting is Daniel has a second vision uh, Nebuchadnezzar sees this. Daniel hears this. This is man's view of civilization. Gold, silver. This is God's view of humanity. We're voracious creatures. Beasts, monsters, killing, plundering, pillaging. But uh, all of that is in the Bible as we start in Romans 15 so that we can have hope. Let's all stand. It's 7.15. And let's uh, close with a word of prayer. And uh, I wish I would have answered all the questions, but there were too many. And so three is enough. But let's bow. Father in heaven, thank you for your scriptures. No matter what we're facing right now, people before us have faced some form of the same thing. Struggles, loss, uh, physical, emotional, spiritual battles. And your word is written to tell us that you are the God that dispenses comfort. You are the God that can increase our patience. And you are the only one that can give us hope. And I pray that tonight that we would believe what you have said, that you are in charge of history and you are working it according to a plan and we just want to get in line and do what we're supposed to do in your plan. And I pray we'd search your word every day prayerfully and just voice to you, here we are, Lord, 
Send us to do whatever you want us to do. And we'll ask you to do that for your glory. In the precious name of Jesus, we pray. And all of God's people said, amen. God bless you as you go out into the storm. <laughs>